What's going on guys? It's Ace Kai and uh, I'm gonna finish this thing. So uh, here's part two of my top 50 uh, Game Boy Advance games list. I would explain how it works, but uh, you could just watch the other video if you really want to see that. Just know that this is not my personal opinion. These are the aggregated scores of several different review websites put together to make a sort of comprehensive list and a look at the best of what the Game Boy Advance has to offer. And let's keep this introduction short because I'd like to get things started off right away. Starting off our list today here at number 25 is Mario Golf Advance Tour. I was excited for this one since I had so much fun with Mario Tennis. Advance Tour came out one year before the tennis game did and it does show a little bit in the overworld. The character sprites look a bit rough and don't always mesh well with the scenery, which kind of looks like they just brought it over from Superstar Saga sometimes. The Mario characters are a bit more involved in this one though, they were mentioned by name a few times, and you can find their lockers with their equipment and stuff in them in the academy. You can definitely tell that this was meant to be a tag-along title for GameCube's Toadstool Tour, as that game is also mentioned a handful of times. You can even port your character and their stats over from this game to play them on the GameCube, which is really neat. The actual game is just like pretty much any other golf game. Fill up the bar and time your press to match the ticks for a nice shot. It feels just a bit off though. I had to adjust my timing a little bit to actually be able to hit which points on the bar I wanted to. My biggest gripe is that the camera doesn't zoom in for when you're putting, but it will zoom in for when you're driving. Seems like it should be the other way around to me. It's pretty much just Hot Shots Golf on the Game Boy Advance though. The character renders even look like characters from Hot Shots Golf. Not as charming as Tennis was, but it's really the only serviceable golf title on the Advance, so if you like golf, you may want to check it out. Number 24 is Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. Now, these games are lucky that they were the first remake that Game Freak ever did, because if this was another Kanto callback in 2020, I'd rip them apart. Fire Red and Leaf Green were voted for the number one spot on thetop10s.com, which is entirely user-based, so it's more loved by the fans than the critics, it seems. This isn't a review of the original Red and Blue, though, so let's just go over what's been changed. I'm playing Leaf Green here because, eh, fuck Charizard. Maybe I'm just spoiled from always playing these games on emulators, but man, do battles feel so slow in this. I wish I could speed them up. They've added the Sevi Islands to the post game, which allows you to catch Johto Pokemon. Uh, you can rebattle trainers using a Seeker, and of course, all the Pokemon get all the additions that came with Generation 3, such as abilities and natures and all that stuff. Some of their typings have been changed. There really isn't much to say about this game. I'm not a fan of Kanto that much, since Game Freak wants to shove it everywhere that they possibly can, but back in the day, I'm sure this was really cool to have, and as a kid, though, I just stuck to Sapphire. Number 23 is WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games. How do you even describe WarioWare to somebody without comparing it to other games? The rapid fire micro games were a completely unique and new idea at the time, and even still, there's only a handful of clones that exist these days, and they all fall short of what WarioWare nails. While WarioWare would go on to make bigger and better entries than this, you can't deny the original's importance. This is the birth of an uncanny, weird, and charming franchise, one that got new releases even still in 2018. To quote Goro Abe, one of the series' designers, WarioWare was born out of a desire to depart from the norm, with that particular kind of fun that you only get when you make something different. I think he was onto something here. The biggest thing that always draws me to WarioWare, besides the micro games of course, is just how much charm it oozes in nearly every entry. The main menu screen is a desktop, the stage that takes place in a taxi has you listening to a catchy tune, the character designs are all memorable due to how much they pop out, each game has a different art style because they were designed by different people on the team. There's just, there's so much love and care put into this game and its sequels which, as we will see, only bring this series to greater heights. Number 22 is Advance Wars 2 Black Hole Rising. Now, spoiler alert, Advance Wars 1 is higher up on the list, so I won't go into too much detail onto what I like about this game, as the two games are nearly identical, and I want to save my praises for a more detailed review. The place they do differ, though, is the campaign and story mode, which I do believe is a little bit more interesting in Black Hole Rising than in the original, and they added the addition of a new unit type, the Neo Tank, which is pretty strong, but it's not unbeatable, so I don't think it breaks the game in any way. Sorry to cut this one short, but these two games really are just that similar, and I want to keep this brief. 
Number 21, Mario vs. Donkey Kong. I was really excited to try this one out, as I've only ever played the sequels to this game involving the Mini Mario wind-up toys, and I think, honestly, they're a bit underrated. So I wanted to see where the series started, as this game, it did not disappoint. In fact, I may even prefer this game to the newer ones. It's a fun little puzzle platformer. It's really short, but the ideas are there. Each world has five standard levels where you get a key to a door, then rescue a mini Mario, then one level where you play Pikmin for a little bit, and then you fight Donkey Kong. There's a lot of cool little stuff in this game too. The whole jungle world feels like Donkey Kong Country, and Mario even climbs like Diddy Kong on the ropes. You can do side hops and stand on your hands and do all kinds of different jumps. I honestly did not expect that much out of this game, but I got a lot more than I anticipated. This is another one of those games that I need to go back to after this. Number 20 is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. How this game was the first on our list to get a triple digit score is beyond me. It never took first place, but consistently it placed higher up on all of them, so what gives? I guess I can understand a little bit. Skateboarding games were big back then, and this was probably the best offering on handheld you could get, but even then, this game feels so weird to control. The perspective makes it hard to tell what's going on. The levels are small and don't offer much besides some half pipes and rails where you can just go around and do tricks to earn money to buy the next level. Maybe that's the appeal though. Since it's simple and short, you could play this game in short bursts on your way to school. But I don't know. I don't think I ever got the appeal that these games ever had. Even as a kid, I never played these skateboarding games. This also marks the last sports game on our list if you consider skateboarding a sport. It is a sport, right? Number 19 on our list, Mega Man Zero. This game and its sequel showed up a handful of times, and I've often heard that they're comparable to the X series, which, I gotta say, is pretty accurate. There are, of course, differences between the two, though. Since you're playing as Zero, you can swap between using a gun and a sword, which comes in handy when dealing with all the different enemy types. You can also collect things called Cyber Elves, which you can activate in the middle of a mission to do varying effects like healing, stunning enemies, etc. The missions are also fairly linear, so you don't get to decide which bosses you want to face and in what order. However, because of this, levels aren't always over after defeating a boss. Sometimes there's extra stuff to do before the level actually ends. If I had to summarize it, I would say, yeah, it is very similar to Mega Man X, but the fact that you're playing as Zero makes it different enough that it feels fresh. Oh, and the story is apparently, like, really good or something, but I only played through the first two missions, so I wouldn't know. And hey, they recently released the Zero Legacy Collection, so fans seem to like it enough to warrant that. Number 18. Super Mario Advance, Super Mario World. Here we are at the second in the Super Mario Advance series, and get ready because the other two are coming up soon. This one is Super Mario World, which immediately upon starting the game, I had to notice, this just looks so much worse than the original. They tried to make the colors brighter to make up for the lack of the, at the time, non-backlit screen, so it was easier to see, but once the backlit screens did come out, then everything just looks so washed out and just ugly compared to the original. It's definitely easier to make Super Mario Bros. 2 look better since it was on the NES and you can do some actual upgrades, but the difference between the Super Nintendo and the Game Boy Advance is a little small, so they did what they could with what they had to work with, I suppose. What's different about this version of the game, though? Well, not much. Really, I'd say the only major difference is the added option of playing as Luigi, who controls like he does in Super Mario Bros. 2, which unfortunately I do not enjoy, but I know there are big Luigi players out there. You also stay in super form if you get hit with the flower or cape, unlike the original reverting you to Tiny Mario immediately, so it's also a little bit easier. All in all, I would just say to skip this one, unless you want to experience playing as Luigi in Super Mario World with Luigi physics, but even then, there's probably a ROM hack for that. Number 17, Castlevania Circle of the Moon. Ah, now here we go. Circle of the Moon gets right what Harmony of Dissonance does wrong, which is weird because it came out a whole year earlier. It's a much better blend of modern, exploration-based Castlevania with the simple combat of the classic Castlevanias utilizing the whip. There's a little bit less customization in this game on the whole, but the big gimmick here is the card system. You can mix and match 10 different cards with 10 different element cards, which end up giving you different magics that you can utilize in various ways. Uh, you play as Nathan Graves, who also isn't that interesting of a protagonist, but at least his game is better. Circle of the Moon is less complex than Harmony of Dissonance, but 
it works to its advantage here, plus the game actually sounds and looks normal. Nothing is really off-putting about this title. I still wouldn't put this in my top 10 Castlevania games, but it's pretty solid. Number 16 is Final Fantasy VI Advance. From this point on, you'll probably be seeing a lot more first place awards. Final Fantasy VI has what is probably the most prestigious and important award. It is Metacritic's top rated Game Boy Advance game, and that really says a lot. This was the last Final Fantasy game to see a port to a handheld device before the rise of smartphones, and trust me, you do not want to play the iOS versions of these games, my god. But what makes Advance any better than the Super Nintendo version? Well, there's not a lot, actually. The audio quality is actually worse, meaning Dancing Mad is butchered quite a bit. They did add some new bosses and an enemy rush type of challenge arena thing, but overall this version is just a straight up port. And inputting Sabin's blitz combos is just really awkward on this tiny handheld. I imagine you'd probably get used to it after a while if you're playing through the whole game though. The reason this ranks so high is because it is, after all, Final Fantasy VI, the cream of the crop when it comes to Super Nintendo era Final Fantasy, or depending on who you ask, the entire Final Fantasy franchise, so there's no surprises here. Number 15 is Mario Kart Super Circuit. This is the only Mario Kart that I had never played until just now. My first impression? This game is so hard to control. Everything feels slippery and awkward. There's some semblance of a drifting function, but I can't seem to make it work. And if I'm playing Mario Kart, I gotta drift. I'd always heard good things about this game, but playing it now, I just... I can't see where they're coming from. I suppose it may have been passable for Mario Kart on the go back in the day, but this game reminds me way too much of Super Mario Kart, which is another one that I don't like. That's not to say that this game doesn't have charm, though. I certainly do like the way it looks. There's cool little background elements in the courses, and each track actually has this cute little preview picture featuring the different racers doing things, which is really interesting. Why have they ever done this again? Overall, I would definitely say to give this game a pass, just play Mario Kart DS, 7, or even 8 Deluxe now that it's on the Switch. Hell, just wait till you get home and play Double Dash. This is the last Mario Kart game I'd ever want to play, and if it was my only option on a long plane flight, I probably would just opt to sleep instead. Sorry, that's a little harsh, but I really did not have a good time with this game. Moving on to number 14 is WarioWare Twisted. This is WarioWare at its peak. Before WarioWare Gold was released a couple years ago, I would have told you that this game is the best in the series. IGN and Nintendo World Report both gave this game their number one ranking. And while I wouldn't put it that high, this game does rank in the top five on Game Boy Advance for me, for sure. But what makes Twisted so special? For 14 years, it went untoppled as the WarioWare title with the most micro games at 223 before Gold had come out. Here's what WarioWare Gold doesn't have. The sheer amount of extra little toys, doodads, mini games. I mean, good God, you could spend entire play sessions just messing with these instead of actually playing the game. It's a shame that this game is so niche and hard to find these days and emulating it is a pain because of the gyroscope. It's just, there's no way to replicate actually playing the real thing. If you could ever get your hands on it, definitely, definitely play this game. It's a magical experience that oozes charm and uniqueness through its very core. Moving on to number 13 is Super Mario Advance 4, Super Mario Bros. 3. And here's another Mario classic ported to the Advance. Thankfully, this one was released later on in the Game Boy Advance's lifespan, so the colors haven't been altered to make up for any lack of lighting or anything. I have to say, even though it's based off of the All-Stars version, for some reason, the Game Boy Advance port just looks a little bit better somehow. Maybe it's the smaller screen? I don't know. There's a lot of differences between this version and the NES and SNES versions. You can do a Mario and Luigi mode, which I assume is meant for two players to hand off their Game Boys and take turns or something like that, but if you're playing by yourself, it just makes for an interesting switch up every time you die or clear a level that lets you play with slightly different controls. Even though Luigi's hovering is still and probably always will be awkward to me, it's a nice change that keeps things a little fresh. 
While there isn't much of a change in the gameplay aspects, Nintendo was pushing this new accessory at the time called the e-reader, which is basically like a card scanning thing that you can put in your Game Boy. You could use it to grant yourself power-ups or lives, and if that's not enough, the e-reader would also give you extra levels to play if you had the right cards. Of course, this is a really old accessory, so playing these levels now is difficult. The Wii U Virtual Console release of the game came with them all intact, but the Wii U is, uh, well... Emulation! Emulation of this game enables you to play these levels that are locked behind these pesky cards. So, don't worry, you'll always have the chance to play them. Even though this was the last of the Advanced series to be released, Super Mario Bros. 3 just doesn't stand a chance against the timeless classic that is number 12 on our list. Number 12? Yoshi's Island. The last Mario port on our list isn't even a Mario game. Well, I guess it kind of is. It's Yoshi's single greatest adventure he's ever had, which still has yet to be topped. This version of the game doesn't hold a candle to the original's beauty on the Super Nintendo, though, but how could it? The SNES version of Yoshi's Island is one of the best-looking games of all time, even today, so I don't blame the Game Boy Advance port for not being able to stand up to it. And you know what? This game has the least amount of changes compared to all the other ports on the list, which means it's all the fun of Yoshi's Island with no gimmicks right in the palm of your hand, and that's why this game is held so highly. Because it's just putting an already great game in the convenience of your pocket. The only difference between the two is that the Game Boy Advance version has six extra bonus levels that are, to be honest, probably the hardest levels in the entire game. You probably will lose a lot of lives to these challenges. But, you know, if you're in for some more fun, some extra levels, totally go for it. Other than that though, this is just 100% Yoshi's Island goodness. And number 11 is Final Fantasy Tactics Advanced. Whew! Dodged a bullet with this one being number 11. Thankfully, I won't have to play through the entirety of this behemoth <laughs> uh, of a game. Oh, man. To be honest, though, I've never played through this game in its entirety. When I was young, the gameplay was too slow for me to hold my tiny little attention span, and I've never revisited it as an adult. I know fans of these games hold them in very, very high regard, and I really should get around to playing them someday, but uh, today is not that day. The only other strategy RPGs I have experience with are Disgaea and Fire Emblem, and Fire Emblem barely counts. From what I understand, though, the game offers some of the series' best job systems, and also boasts some unique classes that you won't find in any mainline title. As far as I can tell, Tactics on the PlayStation 1 is where strategy RPGs really started building themselves up. Before we had Valkyria Chronicles and Disgaea, 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 Prinny Game, we had Final Fantasy Tactics. And the advanced version, while not a port, uses many of the same systems and ideals that made the original so dear to people's hearts. And I promise, I'll get around to playing it eventually. Well, that's all. Make sure you guys tune in next time, because next time, we're going to be hitting the big ones. The top 10 Game Boy Advance games are coming up next.